So t this afternoon, I'll talk about, I guess, what probably would refer to as visualization. And I call it here um, reading the bits. Um, we're going to talk about innovations in uh, protocol analysis that have happened over the last uh, 20 years. And uh, I was surprised as I prepared for this talk, the last thing that I expected to see in you know, the popular press were uh, articles about sniffing. Um, but suddenly, this past week, um, the whole world is uh, learning about packet capture and analysis, what is being kept, what isn't being kept, what's being done with the data, and what used to be a very arcane subject that you all are experts on um, suddenly was big news. So it's interesting to see how, how this uh, technology moves into the public eye. I'll have a couple comments about that at the end. Okay, we're done. There's the data. <laughs> You know, we somehow captured some uh, string of bits. Um, I'm not going to talk about framing and all that other, other kind of stuff. Let's just assume this is the data, as we understand it, um, in some network communication. And of course, this is useless. And the whole conversation that we're going to have this afternoon is really about uh, translating that into something of utility. So there's some things that uh, we're not going to cover at all. Um, how it is you captured those bits um, is a very complex area. It's something that a lot of development has happened uh, over the last 20 years. Um, it was the secret sauce at the beginning, was the magic of how you could capture data from, uh, from various networks that had uh, security and, and, and other things that, that didn't make it easy to promiscuously uh, capture data. So that's an art by itself, but we're not going to talk about that. Uh, we're also not going to talk about how you store the stuff. I mean, you know, what do you do with those terabytes of data? I used to think that was a big number until this last year, you go to Verizon for 200 bucks, you get a terabyte drive. So I don't know what well, we're going to call, where are we going to go? But how you get that stuff out there, where you put it, uh, things about filtering, compression, and so on again, a lot of innovation goes on there, but that's a subject uh, for some other talk. We're going to focus purely on this question of interpreting that data, uh, what you can get out of this simple string of, of bits. And also I should mention there's metadata involved, that's strictly not, if that was some wire data. There's other metadata that's involved. An example of that is sort of the timestamp associated with a packet, um, beginning of, of the data stream, something like that. So that's also captured. Um, my big excuse this afternoon is, you know, I'm not a historian. This is all anecdotal. Um, I'm not going to give you a complete history, and I'm not going to defend everything that we'll talk about as the biggest innovation since sliced cheese. And uh, I'm sure that there are many things I've left out. If we can talk about those at the end. Feel free to email me. Uh, it's an interesting subject to, to look at. And I'm not going to try and present anything in any kind of timeline. That's, again, an interesting subject to figure out how we got from here to there. So let's just dive in and talk about um, what I think uh, some of the innovations have been. I have about a dozen of them that we'll, we'll touch on. As I said, that's probably just uh, the uh, tip of the iceberg. So one feature that is pretty remarkable is this notion of some kind of summary line, something that takes the contents of a frame and manages to squeeze out the really key features and put them in a form that uh, one can rapidly look at the data, see the flow of the operations, the key parameters, and so on. I think this is an area, by the way, that not every analyzer does equally well. Uh, this is a huge amount of art in doing this, as opposed to uh, other, other analyses, which are simply field after field after field. There's a lot of art there and how you might display that and, and allow it to be, to be shown to the user. 
But the idea of just what are the key parameters? You know, how many can you squeeze on a line of text? How do you display that? Uh, how analyzers can show just the highest level summary for certain protocols but not others. There's a lot of art that goes into that. And that's an area where I think uh, we've seen some very good work and some maybe not so great work sometimes. Um, we're all familiar with uh, traditional three window displays. Uh, that was an innovation. Uh, here too you see differences. Um, for example, not all analyzers over the history of time uh, permitted you to, for instance, highlight a byte in the hex window and figure out where it is in the detailed, the detailed uh, dump of the packet. Or, contrarily, to highlight one or more lines in a detailed window and see exactly where that is in the packet. Or to go edit a hex packet and then have that get reflected automatically. Um, in the other windows uh, to see, gee, why is that bit off? What would have happened if that bit were on? So there's a lot of art involved in uh, this particular process. I heard part of the last, uh, the last presentation, and uh, Laura is a great fan of, of coloring rules. Uh, again, I think a very interesting innovation which allows you to set up some form of, of an expression, a logical expression, uh, could be quite complex or quite simple, maybe just selecting a certain uh, type of a protocol from a list. It could be uh, an algebraic function and use that to identify packets at various levels, a filter on that, and so on. Again, uh, very, very useful tool and a way to, uh, to add a lot of information. Uh, analyzers uh, historically were black and white and these days take advantage of of our ability to, uh, to colorize things. One of the interesting innovations, uh, going back to the early days, but not the earliest days, is the idea of treating all the addresses, the nested series of addresses uh, in encapsulated transmissions, with some uniformity in the user interface. That not just MAC level addresses have names associated with them, but IP addresses have a name associated with them and that the same mechanisms that you would use to edit those tables, to search on them, to display things in the source and destination columns, that there should be generality. And uh, if you want to look at things in terms of an IP address or, or some other uh, port numbers, uh, those, are, those should be available. And early analyzers didn't do that. A uh, related innovation is that of automatically figuring out what names should be used by looking among the traffic for packets that contain name information. So if you see a DNS uh, query in the traffic, uh, that, can be an that can easily be analyzed by the analyzer, pull out the name, associate that with an IP address, and use that automatically uh, in displays um, so that users don't have to enter it. Uh, they may save it, they may collect it, uh, but uh, it can save a huge amount of work to actually look at the traffic, not necessarily for finding problems, but for populating useful data. Another innovation that came along is that of open decoder APIs, of finding ways to enable users to add new constructs, maybe to add entire new protocols that the vendor um, didn't have. I don't know how many of you were in this business a long time ago, 20 years ago, but everything wasn't TCP IP. That was a little late to the game, and there were many other protocols which uh, were vying for popularity, and the ability to extend the protocol analyzer to add new protocols was not merely a matter of uh, some um, geek in the lab who was developing the new protocol, but the kind of things that in the field actually happened. People needed to, uh, to extend these things. And that's an area that was, was very valuable um, to allow users to, to do that. We'll talk a little bit about how to, how to do that. Non-obvious innovation uh, that was um, 
developed um, is that of reassembling data um, across frames. So that you have a stream of data, TCP is a good example, you have the, the data stream, but it's been broken up into, into uh, packets, uh, which have headers separating them, and you'd like to actually look at the data stream itself and reassemble it. Um, it's a non-trivial problem to do the reassembly, to find out which packets match, to get rid of duplications, to deal with packet loss. I mean, it's very nice to do in a, in a clean laboratory, but to do reassembly of data um, is far from, far from trivial in the real world. And it gets more and more difficult for other protocols that are not as straightforward as TCP sequence numbers and, uh, and strings. So, um, doing that as an example of something that the analyzer works really hard at doing to make your life trivial if you want to actually look at a data stream and, uh, and, and see the data. But again, to see what I mean by see the data is not that you're then going to look at the reassembled bytes, uh, but then they can be decoded because they're reassembled into a decent sequence and further disassembly can take place. So a whole other area of uh, innovation that uh, is constantly evolving, I would say today, is the idea of expert analysis. And again, in the last talk, there was uh, some examples of that where the analyzer, by following the traffic, can look for specific things which are symptomatic sometimes of normal behavior that's quite acceptable and sometimes of things that are quite horrendous of whether it's uh, retransmissions, changes in flow, uh, throughput analysis um, are examples, um, all, kinds, all kinds of, uh, I mean, literally in our experience in Network General, we had thousands of rules that the system uh, could detect in the various uh, protocols and look for things, none of which were illegal. By illegal, I mean things that actually violated the protocol sequences. These were things that were suspicious, things that you might want to look at, um, that indicated something somewhat out of the ordinary. Um, and they're heuristic, therefore, but valuable. So another interesting area that uh, uh, has been innovative, but probably uh, nowhere near enough, are looking at utilizations and trends and other aspects of the data that, strictly speaking, are not the bits and bytes of a packet. So an example might be looking at the distribution of traffic versus you know, IP addresses. Which ones are popular, which ones aren't, or aggregating data by servers. You know, um, looking at throughputs on, on various pairs of devices, things like that. I remember uh, looking at some of this data and uh, trying to add these kind of features to uh, the products in Network General and uh, f found out how these things were more complicated than one thinks sometimes at, uh, at first blush. Uh, utilization was a good example. So someone has a simple question which is like, well, you know, what percent busy is this network, this Ethernet, right? What, how much capacity is being used? Simple question. Just put up a number, number on the screen and, or see a graph of it going by, and that's the utilization. 20%, 30%, 40%. What is it? Well, actually, that sounds simple, but it's wrong. Okay, because what is the utilization of the cable? It's actually zero or 100%. There, there is no 30% utilization of the band. Either the bit is on or the bit is off. So what do you mean by 30%? Well, what I really mean is that over some time period, 30% of the time the bit was on instead of off. Well, which time period? One second? 15 seconds? A week? And how do I, how do I move that window across the data? What do I do? with the data from the earliest part? Is it just averaged in, uniform average, or is it decaying exponentially, and what curve should it be, and, and so on. So that's uh, a non an example of a non-trivial transformation of the data is to report a utilization in a way that 
jives with what the user would like. Another example of, a, of an innovation in modern analyzers is decryption support. So you may have traffic going, uh, going between uh, some client and servers, and the traffic is encrypted. Uh, well, you know, all you need is the key. Um, and maybe there's a way you can get the key. Uh, and if you can get the key that's being used, uh, then you can actually analyze the data. That, so you can decrypt the data so that you can analyze it. So then you can see something more inside, let's say, the higher level protocols that otherwise are obscured by the decryption, by the encryption. How might you do that? Well, maybe the user knows a key and he enter it at the protocol analyzer uh, to help with this task. Or maybe you can uh, come up with a hacked version of a server that just uh, puts out certain packets that would not normally be there, that have certain information that the protocol analyzer knows about and participates in this conversation in a way that is somewhat non-standard and used for the purposes of, of doing decryption. Uh, so it is not the case that when network traffic is decrypted, you're screwed. It's hard, but not impossible. Another innovation recently, we talked about APIs that allowed protocol analysis, and these would typically uh, involve writing a program in C or the favorite language of, of your choice. Um, there are examples of where uh, the parsers can be written in a language maybe designed for parsing that has certain features, has certain data structures, has other ways of dealing with all these concepts that a normal language perhaps wouldn't have to worry about, but would be easy to write a parser uh, for some new protocol. And there are examples of those products in the market. There are performance challenges of doing all these things all at the same time on all the traffic, but that's Again, a subject for maybe a different topic. Uh, another example of a feature that um, is very handy to have is the ability to actually take notes on the trace file. So that uh, when you're going through a trace and looking at things, that actually you can have sort of footnotes, little asterisks on the frames perhaps, that would describe, oops, this doesn't look good, what's going on here? You can send them to your buddy in England and he can look at them and maybe he can annotate it. And this is not just a trace file of the data bytes or the decodes, but rather has, but rather has useful auxiliary information that's added to the packet. So there's probably a lot of other things that uh, people could be doing. And uh, let me mention some. And uh, anyone here who um, says, oh, yes, that's actually, you know, that problem's been solved, you can raise your hand and we'll talk about it. Uh, I'm not that uh, up to date on every single product and every single feature that they have. So these are just some of the, some random thoughts that uh, maybe you think are uh, already there. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, the notion that users would have IP routers in their homes, <laughs> uh, among other things, you know, seemed bizarre to me, to, the, to this guy. If you ask me to predict what, what, whether that was going to come to pass, okay, that seemed quite unlikely. Uh, but, you know, the reality, uh, people go to their local hardware emporium and they learn all about NAT and other things, and uh, they're, they're, they're dealing with uh, uh, a router that's built into their DSL modem, and then they buy another router that's in their that's in their wireless uh, access point, to, and so on. And it's an incredibly complicated network that's at the end of a line to Joe Joe Blow's home. And then you say, well, what's there to help Joe Blow when things don't work? And uh, as far as I can tell, the state of the art there is where it was in, in enterprise networks 20 years ago. It's like, uh, duh, turn it off. 
<laughs> Reboot it. Uh, check the cable. Bring it back. Get the get a new ver upgrade the firmware. No tools are being used. But I yet yeah, I know. Okay. Why aren't these devices you know, capturing traces? Why isn't someone sitting in Omaha, you know, looking at the trace that's being caught by the poor user who can't figure out, you know, why they're they're not able to connect to a certain site and so on. Um, so there are challenges <laughs> to, do, to accomplish this. Um, so maybe some of you will figure out how to solve those challenges and come up with, with tools that range from network butt sets to complicated distributed network analyzers that are suitable uh, for home users. Uh, this is somewhat related, um, although I think of it in a broader context, not specifically in the home, and that is essentially turning our trade, adding to our trade, a bit more active involvement in the network itself. Uh, the main applications of protocol analyzers have been passive. We want to see what's happening. We don't want to interfere. We just want to capture, capture packets and, and look at them and from that deduce all the bad stuff that's happening and be able to fix it. But just gee, I mean, if I could just inject the traffic itself, if I could run a test case and at the same time watch the traffic or mangle a packet and see what happens. I mean, there are lots of things where you can actively test to what degree the network is working by injecting problems, injecting probes. You know, if you want to find out response time, people know, okay, look at a series of pings, but why isn't that just you know, one button that sends it out, does it? There's and a, the answer is? There's a, there's a product called My Connection Server. There we go. That does that, you can throw. Right, so I think this is a, a, a under, underdeveloped area as far as I know. Another thing that, uh, is, is useful um, is to keep, when, when people have problems, you want to find out, well, how did I get here? What just happened? And the predicament is, certainly again for a home user, but this is true in enterprise environment, you can't keep everything forever. So depending on how, many, how much money you have and how much storage you have, yes, you can have a terabyte. Yes, you can have 100 terabytes, but you, know, you can't have everything. So the question is, what about you know, systems which will automatically keep Recent data and higher resolution and farther away data and lower resolution and really farther. So I could really go back and say, gee, you know, what was my maybe network utilization over the last month? And I'll get that with a certain granularity. And if I want packets from today, I can get that. And maybe if I want to find out, you know, distribution of IP addresses from last week, I could get that. But certain data will be available at different resolutions as you went back in time. Seems like today it's you get all or nothing, either you can afford to keep the data or you can't. Like it's really hard to, to analyze if you have a lot of data. That's the other predicament. Um, there are some interesting products which uh, are used primarily by um, developers to see whether or not implementations of protocols are, are working. They generally work today by blasting the servers with incorrect sequences of packets and seeing whether or not they handle the error cases correctly. Shouldn't respond to this, shouldn't respond to that. It's referred to as fuzzing. But it is also true that just general sequence errors and problems um, in protocols um, could be detected, a kind of an expert analysis. And uh, you could have a product which knows uh, what the correct rules and algorithms and choices within those rules were made by a vendor and you could turn it on and say, you know, tell me if it's, if it's not working. And again, there are some things related to that area, but it's not a standard feature of protocol analysis today. Um, how do you control your analyzer? Um, maybe use a mouse, uh, but if you think about it, the, you know, why not go more toward uh, uh, minority report style controls and uh, think about other ways to look at the data. It's a very rich set of data and uh, to use a mouse and windowing and you know, even text-based windows strikes me as very much out of tune with the way we build 
useful UIs today. And uh, I don't, can't give you a great example of why exactly how you would do this, but it just strikes me that it's an area we haven't seen a lot of innovation in, in the last 20 years. Pretty much using the same old stuff, using st standard widgets uh, from a, a windowing, a windowing uh, data set. And the same is true for the kind of displays that, uh, that are given to us. They're either text driven, they're very simple pie charts, uh, very simple line graphs. I'm a big fan of Edward Tufte, and uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant uh, statistician which wrote about how to, uh, how to reveal information and data using useful charts and useful innovative ways of looking at the data. I highly recommend to anyone that you take a look at his book, which I think the first volume is called Envisioning Data. Visual Display of Quantitative Information. Thank you. Visual Display of Quantitative Information. Excellent. And you'll see that the, the, the delta between the kind of displays that he shows there that highlight what's going on and what you will find on you know, your favorite particle analyzer are just you know, not in the same league. Um, and what you, too, you do find, he kindly talks about as chart jump. Um, and he's got a wonderful essay about uh, why you should never use PowerPoint. That's not, not in the book, but a good thing. Yeah? But doesn't he also have an artist background? Not to me, techies are also very good with humanity. You know, there are companies, Apple comes to mind, who hire lots of artists to make sure their products work well and look good and are functional and have good UI. So I think there's an opportunity there. That's just says, an opportunity for innovation. And uh, I mean, the good thing is, frankly, you know, we have seen, and I tried to acknowledge that earlier, there are displays that are useful, like uh, we talked about, but I think not shown in the last presentation, looking at, you know, sequence numbers of traffic, and you can see breaks and retransmissions and, and so on. Uh, but um, what uh, he points out is that just showing uh, uh, transmission and, and act numbers as parallel lines might not be the best way, to, if what you're looking for is to see whether or not you have high window utilization, seeing two lines that you know, start down here, go up there, is, may not be the right way to look at that data. If what you really want to do is see how far apart those two lines are, then maybe there's a better way to do it. So that's his, his style. Another area that I'm not aware of, and, and, and perhaps uh, someone here is, is, um, Correlating together data that is the same data, but at different points in space, uh, but actually having analyzers at various points along a path, um, and having timestamps and figuring out how the heck you actually synchronize the timestamps accurately enough to to sort of merge in some sense. And by merge, I don't mean merge the data, but analyze the difference between what I see at a client and what I see at a server, what I see at the router, and the answer is. Opnet AC analyst. Okay. It does all that. Does all that. It can you can uh, take captures at the same exact time yes, right. on multiple places and right. then it merges everything and uh, it's what is this called? It's very well, first of all, it's very, very expensive. That's good. <laughs> you like that. But it's a, it's a product from my uh, from the East Coast where I am, uh, and the company's Opnet and uh -huh. they make a suite of products. Um, one of them is Ace Analyst Plus. They also make uh, IT Guru uh, um, okay. Panorama, no. which does. <laughs> no. okay. I mean, I'm not trying to push them, but they do. No, no, very, good, very good. 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 So, you know, and there's no reason why Wireshark couldn't do it too. And probably a lower price point. Uh, it just takes a little longer to get Hopefully, there. Hopefully, yeah. Um, the main challenge, I think, and I haven't done this, but the main challenge, I think, is figuring out how to get the, how to get the timestamps aligned. I don't think that's that hard a problem. I do that all the time, by the way, but not in, not in this discipline of packet analysis. I do it all the time after every vacation I take. <laughs> when I collect together the photographs from the four other people who were on the vacation with me, okay, and you find everyone's timestamp and their JPEGs, right, are off. They're all off by a constant amount, right? So they're all, someone didn't change the time zone, someone's off by a minute, 30 seconds. Uh, the calendar is set wrong, PM instead of AM, and I have this interesting problem when I get home of figuring out what corrections to apply. And by the way, if someone has a product which does that, I, I, will, I will pay for that product. 
I want to give it set A, B, C, D of photographs and have it tell me the plus or minus deltas to give to them. And the uh, answer is? Graphic converter does a lot of that kind of work, batch, <laughs> batch <laughs> operations. I can do the batch operation. It's figuring out the right deltas. Oh, the delta I, want it, I want it to look at the data, figure out which pictures were really the same picture mm -hmm. taken at roughly the same time. Simple solution, just think the same picture at the same time. Beginning of the picture, beginning of the day. Yeah, the like, uh, everybody ready, set, snap. <laughs> <laughs> and have a little clapper board. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So there's a lot to do, and this is by far not a not a meant to be any kind of complete list. And it sounds like there's some good progress being made um, in some of these areas. Uh, there's probably a lot of other things uh, that. Uh, that will represent innovations. I think it's an incredible field. I mean, if you think about what's happened here, we're starting off with those little zeros and ones that we uh, saw at the beginning, and I don't think we've squeezed all the information out of that that we can. And the wonderful thing is we have these uh, computers that are just getting faster and faster and faster, so that some pretty heavy-duty uh, analysis can happen, you know, the flick of a page down key. Um, and so I think these, these kind of things and a lot more uh, will come to pass. So let me ask you, any other questions? Thanks for your real-time feedback. I know I'm uh, the last thing between you and your reception, so I don't want to stretch this out, but I'm happy to have a conversation or answer any specific questions. How soon will we have a Network General iPad app? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> uh, it's not clear whether Apple would, whether violates Apple's SDK rules on uh, <coughs> developing products. And what could you plug it into? It's at the wireless. It has no ports. What was your opinion on Google collecting the, the data? The Wi-Fi. Oh, what was? What do I think about? Um, I don't think the story has come out about where that data is and what their policies have been to actually keep it and so on. I think uh, uh, they've told the story of how, as they say, that somehow inadvertently they, they were collecting, collecting the traffic because of the particular software they used and they had someone write a detailed report of what, of what the software did and its history. So I think they put their cards on the table, but they haven't answered the real question of, of, uh, so then what? Who had access to it? When did they? Was it ever used? I assume they're doing an audit of that internal. They don't tell me. Yeah, um, I just want to point out the, the, the software that got them in trouble was Kismet, which yes. was written by Mark Gershaw. It was done on yesterday's wireless presentation. So. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I see Mike anywhere, but uh, he's around here somewhere. Not being a privacy bus, buff, I guess I could be flippant and say, you know, serves you right for running an open network. <laughs> Hello, I mean, but uh, I don't think that's where the issue is, particularly in, in Europe. Anything else? Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for staying today.